Looking to earn PDH credits for watching this webinar? Please log in to SFP's eLearning platform and select this webinar. Earning PDH credits for this webinar on this platform are free for SFP members, but non-members will be charged. If you're just looking to listen or share information on fire protection engineering, feel free to continue with videos here. So today I'll be talking about uh, ventilation controlled fires and L-shaped training crops. And I'll go over some background and motivation for the project, and then I'll move on to the experiments themselves, describing the setup and the procedure that we followed. Then I'll get into some of the results and analysis, and lastly I'll follow up with what it all means for the fire service and how the results can be applied to training. So this study or this part project is a part of a four part project uh, that's funded by DHS FEMA assistance to firefighters grant program. And it's looking at uh, different aspects of the fire service training environment, including the safety, fidelity and exposure. This one uh, in particular looked at purpose built props. So what's the point of, of studying the live fire training environment? Well, today, firefighters are responding to less and less fires than they have in the past, which means they have less and less on the job experience. So they have to get this experience from somewhere. And that's where training comes in, especially with live fire training. The standard that drives that or that's followed uh, during live fire training is NFPA 1403. And in the standard, there's uh, numerous items, including uh, requirements for what's needed for setup for life fire training evolutions, the responsibilities of instructors, safety officers, participants, and it also provides guidelines for what types of fuels can and can't be used. And it essentially it limits your fuel loads to wood-based fuels, uh, which have the has the potential to be problematic uh, because the conditions produced by uh, wood-based fuels can be different from what's produced by synthetic materials and foam plastics, which are typically the fuel loads seen by firefighters uh, when they're on the job. So it's all about bridging this gap between what firefighters experience in training and how they can use these experiences to uh, be more effective in the field. Essentially, what do we need to know about the limitations of training fires um, and how can they be stated to allow firefighters to be more effective in the field and properly train them. So I'm, here's a quick overview video of the, the project itself. So as you heard from Robin uh, in the video, assuming the audio worked, uh, we looked at three different types of walk instructions. We looked at a gypsum built prop that was meant to simulate uh, residential structure. And then we looked at two different types of metal container props. One uh, that was just made of the corrugated steel and then one with an additional layer of insulation. 
And these L-shaped props are used for several reasons. Uh, they're purpose-built, meaning that they're not meant to encompass all different aspects of training, so they focus on uh, one or two aspects of training. And the L-shape in particular, you can practice advancing a hose line down a hallway and making a turn into the room. Um, you can also demonstrate flow path between the window vent of the fire room and the door vent of the hallway. And it's a pretty simple layout. It doesn't take up much space and it's pretty cost effective. So we're looking at a number of things with this project, uh, starting with are the thermal conditions repeatable in each type of the prop? And do the fuel loads also produce repeatable conditions? And this repeatability is uh, important not only for the applicability of the experimental results, but also for training. Uh, so instructors want to give students all a similar experience. So they want the first evolution of students that they send through, they want that experience to be as similar to the last evolution that they send through um, so that all students are experiencing this, the same thing. We also looked, there once the repeatability was established, we looked at how the fire conditions differed between the different types of props and how the conditions differed between the different types of fuel loads. And lastly, we looked at how interior suppression affected the firefighters' local environment uh, within each prop and was it different between the metal containers and the gypsum prop. So moving on to the setup, starting with the different types of props. Uh, this is a picture of the gypsum prop. And so the interior walls were lined with gypsum board along, and then behind the gypsum board were wood studs uh, and fiberglass insulation what you would typically see in a residential structure. The hallway uh, was 23 and a half feet, roughly, and it was connected to the fire room here. We, uh, with the gypsum prop, we had an instrumentation room that we used for storage and uh, placement of instrumentation components uh, that to get to uh, isolate them from the fire environment. But this room here is uh, was blocked off, so we still got had that L shape. The metal and insulated metal props from the exterior uh, looked identical. They're both composed of a 30 foot uh, C container and then a 20 foot long C container perpendicular uh, to the 30 foot. And a wall was installed down the middle to uh, split the prop into two mere L shapes. And this was done so we could uh, run the experiments more efficiently, burn on one side, and then instead of letting uh, that side or waiting for that side to cool, we could just switch over to the other side. The interior of the metal props is where they differed. So on the left side is just the metal prop, which you can see the walls just composed of that corrugated steel. And on the right side is the insulated metal prop and the walls are composed of rolled steel sheeting uh, over top uh, mineral wool insulation with the corrugated steel as the backing. For instrumentation, we collected a number of measurements. Uh, we got, we looked at the heat flux and temperatures in the fire room and just outside the hallway and at the start of the hallway. And we looked at the gas velocities at each vent, the window vent in the fire room and the uh, door vent in the hallway. We measured pressures in the hallway in the fire room. And we looked at gas concentrations in the fire room at the uh, doorway that to the hall and at the window vent. Moving on to the fuel loads, we looked at three fuel loads. Uh, one was pallets, what we referred to as the pallets fuel load. And it was composed of three wooden pallets and a bale of straw. It's typically what uh, firefighters use to train with it are straw and pallets. Sometimes they'll add uh, other wood based fuels like OSB. So we had a second uh, NFPA 1403 compliant fuel package that we referred to as the pallets and OSB fuel load. And it's just the pallets and straw fuel load uh, with three additional sheets of OSB, two on the side. Uh, up against the wall and then one suspended over the fuel load from the seal. Uh, both these fuel loads were placed on a metal stand, so they were elevated, but elevated about a foot off the ground. And the stand was 
centered along the back wall of the fire room. Our third fuel load was composed of uh, modern furnishings that contained a couch uh, or a sofa, and then an end table and a coffee table, and then we also lined the floor with uh, carpet padding. Moving on to the uh, experimental procedure. So if you'll recall the project objectives, we we're looking at a number, number of things. We we're looking at the repeatability of the prop and fuel load and how the environments differ between the props and how they differ between the fuel loads. And lastly, we wanted to investigate uh, the effects of interior suppression on the firefighter's immediate exposure. So to perform or to test repeatability, we uh, performed three replicate tests per prop. And these tests involved lighting the fire with both the window vent and the door vent closed, allowing the fire to grow and then decay as it became ventilation limited. And then six minutes after ignition, uh, once the, the fire was in that state of decay, we opened up the hallway door, uh, giving a, the fire a fresh source of oxygen, and we allowed it to grow and reach a fully developed state. And then 12 minutes later, it was suppressed. And for the repeatability, we used a different fuel load in each prop. So we were testing not only the repeatability of the props, but also the repeatability of the fuel loads. For comparing the different props and different fuel loads to one another, uh, we ran uh, tests with the same procedures in the props, and then we compared data between them. So holding the fuel load constant, how do the environments uh, vary between the different props? And then uh, vice versa for fuel loads. So in each prop, how did the fuel loads vary? And lastly, looking at the uh, firefighter, or the effects of suppression on the firefighter's environment, we conducted uh, three of these tests one per prop using the pallets and OSB uh, fuel load. And the test began uh, by igniting the fuel package, but the at the time of ignition, the hall door was open. And then six minutes later, uh, firefighters entered the hallway uh, to perform suppression and they flowed water while they moved down the hallway in a wall ceiling wall pattern. And we, with these experiments, we focused on uh, comparing heat flux data that was collected by a, a heat flux gauge uh, on the firefighter's helmet as they were uh, suppressed and made their way down the hallway. So we'll look at some results and analysis now, starting with uh, the repeatability assessment of the props and the fuel loads. So, <clears throat> the test procedure resulted in basically two uh, periods of the test. One is the initial growth period, which is when the vents were closed and the fire was allowed to grow and then decay. And then the second period is the post-vent period, which is when the fire regrew after the hall door was open. And so to assess repeatability, uh, we looked at the period leading up to uh, the max temperatures and the, during the initial growth period. And then uh, we also compared temperatures during the growth and fully developed stages of the post-vent period. And we were looking at the hot gas layer temperatures specifically. So this is a plot of the uh, repeatability experiments or the ceiling temperature during the repeatability experiments in the gypsum prop. And I've highlighted the portions that we were comparing uh, between these three tests. So the question really comes down to what's, what's considered repeatable. If we take this plot as an example, uh, which is a plot of the start hall temperatures uh, during the post event period, uh, between the metal prop, which is in the blue, and the insulated metal prop, which is in red, 
we can look at we can just look at the plant and say well they look pretty similar and we can add the fact that the uh, total expanded uncertainty that we estimated for thermocouples was 15 percent and we can say like yeah they uncertainties and shaded areas overlap for most of the crop but we need a better way than just looking at these temperatures and kind of making a qualitative assessment. We need some sort of quantitative measure. So I applied an established statistical technique to the data sets uh, between the experiments, or the hot gas layer data, and essentially categorized uh, the comparison result into one of three levels of agreeability. Uh, one of those categories being highly agreeable, which is where most of the plots overlapped, kind of like we saw in the previous slide. Uh, the second category would be agreeable, which means that over half the plots overlapped. And the last would be significantly different, which means that less than half of the plots overlap. So comparisons between uh, replicate tests suggest that the that repeatable environments are able to be produced in each type of prop uh, during both the initial growth period and post vent period. There was one exception to this, however. Uh, so this is a GIF that was generated by pictures we took during our first test in one of the metal props. And essentially what happened is the interior environment heated, heat transfer uh, went from the environment through the wall and eventually uh, the paint reached its auto ignition temperature and lit off on the exterior. So once we saw this, uh, we decided that we would categorize these initial tests in each side of each metal prop as burn-in tests because we wanted to investigate if these visual differences translated the quantitative differences uh, between the thermal environments. So this, this is just a picture of the exterior damage to the metal prop. So on the left is uh, before the burn-in, and on the right is after the burn-in. You can see a significant portion of the paint has been burned away. Now, as for the insulated metal prop, we didn't, we never saw the uh, exterior paint ignite because that additional layer of mineral wool insulation slowed down the heat transfer enough that the exterior never, never even got close to reaching the auto ignition temperature of the paint. However, we did uh, observe significant damage uh, in other areas. So on the left side is before, uh, before the burn-in test, and on the right side is after the burn-in test on this slide. And you can see that one of the windows fell off uh, because the welds on the hinges popped. And uh, when we, the firefighter went to open the window before suppression, uh, the shutter fell off and we actually got this on video so you can, you'll see uh, when he goes to open the first shutter he's struggling with opening it because the the metals deformed uh, but he gets it open and similar thing on the second shutter So in, in addition to the window shutter falling off, we also saw that the welds uh, that were, or the, yeah, the welds on the rolled metal shield, sheeting that was placed over the mineral wool insulation uh, popped. We had a bunch of them pop after the first test, and then in later tests, uh, we would hear them pop every now and then due to the expanding and contracting of the uh, metal as the environment heated and cooled. So uh, in terms of quantitative results, the burn-in tests differed uh, from the later replicate tests that were conducted during the initial growth period. Uh, it, the temperatures that were measured uh, during this period in the later replicates were significantly more severe than those measured during the burn-in tests. However, 
during the post event period, um, the results were just as agreeable as the replicate tests. So we measured the leakage associated with each prop uh, before burn-in tests and after the burn-in tests. And you can see from this bar graph of these results that the props were significantly leakier after the first test. And this is, as a result, uh, the temperatures were more severe during the initial growth period in the, in the later tests because there was more leakage in the prop that meant there was more oxygen for combustion, which meant the fire was able to burn uh, for a, a longer duration before it became ventilation limited. So uh, we also saw that the fuel loads were repeatable, <clears throat> but the conditions were repeatable, but the growth times and growth rates weren't necessarily repeatable. So this is a uh, plot of the ceiling temperatures in the fire room of the furniture replicate tests. And you can see, especially after or during the post vent period, uh, that the regrowth times, if you will, of uh, the furniture varied on the order of minutes. Um, whereas for the wood-based fuels, like this is a ceiling temperature plot of the pallets and OSB replicate tests. You can see that they are they vary very slightly uh, on the order of seconds instead of minutes. And that was the same story with the pallets uh, fuel load. And this has a lot to do with uh, the geometry of the fuel load and the fact that uh, the, uh, the wood-based material is able to char and, and uh, smolder better than the furniture. So now we'll look at how the uh, environments varied between the different props and between the different fuel loads. Uh, we found that there was a difference between the props and that the environments uh, measured in the gypsum prop were more severe than they were in the metal props. Uh, between the two metal props, we didn't we did not find that the insulation uh, affected the the thermal environments between the two props. However, the insulation did uh, affect the time it took for the ins the interior of the insulated prop to cool after our experiments. So you can see uh, this is these are videos of the furniture tests and the gypsum prop on the left side and the metal prop on the right side. And this is after the hall door was open. So it's after the fire re has regrown. And you can, uh, in the gypsum prop, we get fire down the hallway and out the door, whereas that never occurred in the metal prop or the insulated metal prop. And this is, a uh, likely due to the fact that with the metal props, uh, the, there's more heat that's being dissipated from the environment to the walls at a quicker, quicker rate um, due to the high thermal conductivity of metal compared to the low thermal conductivity of gypsum. And so as uh, you get closer and closer to that door, the environment is not as hot and the smoke isn't able to reach its ignition temperature and light off as it did in the gypsum prop. And we saw this not only visually, but also in our data. So we can look at the heat flux and temperatures at the end of the hall, just outside the fire room, and at the start of the hall, eight feet in from the doorway. So this is the uh, heat flux uh, that was measured three feet above the floor at the end hall and start hall locations. So the end hall's in blue, start hall's in red, or in orange, and the solid lines is, uh, the heat flux measured during the gypsum experiments and the dashed lines are during the metal experiments, <clears throat> both with furniture. And you can see that the heat flux in the gypsum prop was significantly higher than that measured in the metal prop. And uh, 
in fact, at the start hall location, uh, which we saw flames in the gypsum prop, but, but uh, no flames in e the, either metal prop. You can see that the heat flux exceeds 20 kilowatts per meter squared uh, during the, the test in the gypsum prop, whereas we did peaked just a little above five kilowatts per meter squared at that location uh, during the, the metal prop tests. And we also saw that there was a difference between fuel loads. This was expected. It's part of the reason that NFPA 1403 uh, restricts fuel loads to wood-based materials. Uh, the furniture produced the most severe environment uh, due to the composition of uh, the components with the synthetic materials and foam plastics. And the OSB uh, or pallets and OSB fuel load produce more severe conditions than the pallets fuel load as expected. And the uh, environments measured during the pallets and OSB tests caused some areas, or er, uh, we measured that the environments were more similar to the uh, tests that were conducted with the furniture uh, than they were to the tests conducted with just the pallets fuel load. So that suggests that if you're gonna be using uh, additional pieces of OSB with your pallets and straw fuel load, uh, it's recommended you exercise caution. So, you know, knowing that the heat flux outside the fire room is uh, 20 kilowatts per meter squared, that's nice, but how does that relate to uh, to firefighters. So to apply it as such, we looked at different thresholds uh, that firefighter PPE has been tested to. So there was a, uh, a NIST grant contract with the Illinois Fire Service Institute several years ago, and they were looking at the uh, exposure of face pieces to heat fluxes, and they found that visual damage uh, to the face piece lens uh, became evident after 90 seconds of uh, exposure to uh, 10 kilowatts per meter squared. And then in a, another NIST uh, report, they, they reported that at 15 kilowatts per meter squared, the face piece lens reaches its glass transition temperature after 30 seconds and after 300 seconds, Oh, sorry. Uh, so then in FPA 1981, which is the standard on uh, SCBA face piece lenses, tests lenses to uh, 15 kilowatts per meter squared exposure for 300 seconds. Now this uh, standard was updated uh, after the NIST report about face pieces came out. So there's still firefighters who use face pieces that aren't tested at this standard. But even the ones that are, um, you can maintain positive pressure within the mask after that exposure, but you can also you can still have significant damage to the mask, including uh, a hole that's formed in the mask. As long as you're maintaining that positive pressure, you you pass that standard test. And then uh, both the NFPA 1981 and 1971, which is the firefighter PPE standard, uh, they require gear to withstand an exposure to a 500 degrees Fahrenheit environment for 300 seconds. So knowing these uh, limits of the PPE, we can look at the temperatures and heat fluxes that are measured uh, around the height of a firefighter, so three feet, four feet above the floor. Uh, in areas that firefighters may be during training exercises, specifically the start hall location and end of the hall location just outside the fire room. So this is comparing the three different fuel loads in the metal prop. Uh, we have furniture in the blue plot, pallets in the orange plot, and pallets in OSB in the green plot. And this is one of the areas where the pallets in OSB is more similar to the furniture fuel than the 
then the just the pallets fuel oil. Now you can see that after the doors open, the uh, environment at the end hall location, the heat flux peaks around 10 kilowatts per meter squared for the pallets. Uh, however, with the pallets and OSB and furniture, 15 kilowatts per meter squared is exceeded uh, for longer than the uh, 300 second duration. And there's a similar story with the start hall and, and hall temperatures. So same, same colors, uh, blues furniture, orange is pallets, green is pallets and OSB. And this plots over the same period of time after the door is open and the fire regrew. And the solid lines are the end hall uh, measurements and the dash lines are the measurements at the start of the hall. And again, this is at around firefighter level. And you can see that uh, with the, pa the uh, pallets fuel load, the temperature at the end of the hallway exceeded the 500 degree F threshold um, almost for that 300 second duration that 1971 requires gear to be tested to. Uh, but at the start hall location, the temperature never exceeded 500 got around 400 as a max. Whereas for the temperatures during the furniture and pallets and OSB experiments, uh, those both significantly exceeded the 500 degree Fahrenheit threshold uh, for, five, for more than five minutes. In terms of uh, visual differences, we looked at the uh, neutral plane at the front door between the three fuel loads. So this is the metal prop tests with pallets, pallets and OSB and furniture. Uh, pallets and OSB is on the left, furniture is on the right, and pallets is in the middle. And you can see that uh, with the furniture, the smoke's a little darker, the uh, neutral plane's a little lower, but the concept remains the same of uh, neutral plane formation. So the bottom line here is that wood-based fuels can be used to teach uh, this, this kind of, this concept of the neutral plane and flow path development. And uh, just looking at the gas velocities at that doorway quickly, we can see that the uh, fact that the neutral plane was lower in the furniture experiments, which is shown on this plot, on the right hand side, uh, positive flows out the door, uh, negative flows into the door. And you can see that the uh, gas velocity at the middle of the door was still up on the top part of the neutral plane or above the neutral plane with positive outflow. Whereas with the pallets and pallets and OSB, uh, this was not the case. But again, the concepts still the same and can be taught with these wood-based fuels. So lastly, uh, we'll look at the interior suppression effects on the firefighter's local environment within each prop. And what we found is that there was a difference in the heat flux that was measured uh, to the fire, the heat flux to the firefighter that was measured between the gypsum prop and the metal props. And the we have some qualitative evidence as well with firefighter same firefighter performed suppression during all three tests and he stated that it was noticeably hotter uh, in the metal props after water flow began than it was in the gypsum props. And so again, we measured the heat flux uh, with two gauges on the firefighter's helmet, one looking in the horizontal direction and one looking in the vertical direction. And so not only can we compare these heat fluxes uh, between each other, but we can compare it to the fixed measurement uh, at the start hall location, which is eight feet in from the hall doorway and three feet above the floor. <clears throat> this will give us an idea of what kind of heat flux should be expected uh, because that's around firefighter height. And so that, that expected heat flux is plotted here in the uh, red line and the uh, heat flux to the firefighter uh, 
is plotted in the other lines. The orange is the metal prop test, the blue is the gypsum prop test, and the green is the insulated metal prop test. And the uh, so the the expected heat flux came from a test with the same procedure, but we did not uh, perform suppression down the hallway. Suppression was performed later. So that's why those temperatures or those heat fluxes uh, do not drop. It's because no suppression was performed at the time. However, going back to the firefighter helmet measurements, we can see that the firefighter entered uh, around the same time, just before 360 seconds. And <clears throat> as he entered the prop, she started to flow water. And we can see that the peak heat flux is measured in the insulated metal prop. And the metal prop uh, peaked around nine kilowatts and 10 kilowatts per meter squared, respectively. Whereas in the gypsum prop, the heat flux peaked uh, just below six kilowatts per meter squared. And so these are significantly different uh, values. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, and with the metal props environments being hotter. And it was over a brief period of time, but again, the firefighter who was performing suppression uh, specifically noted that it, you know, it was a noticeable difference between the environments. And so this uh, difference is suspected to be due to an increase in steam production. So the lining on both metal props was a, a steel, rolled steel sheeting, which it then steals a conductor, whereas uh, gypsum board is more of an insulator. And so as a result, more steam conversion occurred uh, as water was flowed initially in the uh, metal props than in the gypsum props. So what does all this mean for firefighter training and how can firefighters use these results to improve their training? Uh, one thing we saw that was that uh, specific aspects of ventilation controlled fires were able to be generated in metal props. And I say specific because it, it wasn't all aspects. So if we looked at the gypsum prop uh, furniture experiments, as you'll recall, the environments were different between the uh, gypsum prop and the metal props. And this, this was the gypsum prop with furniture was considered our closest representation of you know, uh, modern fires and the environments you would see with those. But again, this is a smaller scale prop. But what we saw was that the environments weren't as severe in the metal prop, but how significant is this difference in the conditions between the furniture, the furniture burns? Uh, it's not, particularly significant because you're still not going to get uh, quote unquote realistic conditions because if assuming you're following an FPA 1403 uh, because you're using wood-based fuels which already produce significantly less severe uh, conditions. What's important is that the ventilation controlled behavior was still able to be replicated uh, in the metal props and the gypsum prop. And so we found that with these wood-based fuels, you could produce ventilation limited conditions. And this is significant because the fires in uh, today's structures are typically fuel rich and houses are more energy efficient. So the, and other factors combined uh, to form the fact that fire, the fires that firefighters see today are likely to be ventilation limited. And so this curve uh, represents a general growth of today's fires where it'll grow and then oxygen becomes less and less and eventually it decays. And then if a change in ventilation is made, uh, the fire will grow to a more intense fully developed state. And so the importance of achieving ventilation limited conditions during training with wood-based fuels is that it, uh, you can avoid uh, the trainees possibly developing false notions, such as venting always equals cooling, because 
that is typically the case uh, when you're dealing with a fire that's fuel limited. And this is uh, usually with the concrete, more traditional uh, concrete burn buildings that firefighters train in. These buildings uh, are si significantly leaky and it's very difficult at times unless you make modifications to the burning or to the, to the building itself to get these ventilation limited conditions. And so you can see here, this is just uh, the fire room temperatures during uh, the test in the metal prop with pallets. And you can see we got that the behavior with all vents closed, it was able to go ventilation limited. And then once the uh, ventilation opening was introduced through the front door, it grew to a more fully developed state. However, if the props sustain more damage through firefighters cutting holes in them for whatever reason, it's uh, very possible that this ability to produce ventilation limited conditions uh, is no longer a thing with the prop because the fact that ventilation limited conditions can be produced is essentially a function of uh, the leakage of the prop and the fire size of the prop. And we also saw that the wood-based fuel loads were able to be used to demonstrate flow path and neutral plane development in these kinds of props. So if you recall the video of the neutral planes, you can see that the neutral plane of the furniture was lower and the smoke was a little darker. But the same concept and same general behavior occurred. We also saw that the wood-based fuels are able to create repeatable fire behavior in the metal props. And so this repeatability or ability to produce repeatable conditions is, as I mentioned previously, very important for instructors because instructors, one, want the fires, uh, the training fires that they train students in to be predictable and behave as expected. And also uh, they want them to be consistent. So if they're running evolutions of multiple students through, everybody gets uh, the same or as close to the same experience as possible. And lastly, we saw that the uh, wood-based fuels were still able to produce conditions that have the potential to cause thermal injuries to firefighters in full PPE. And we saw that looking at the heat flux uh, at the end hall and start hall locations. And this it, it was especially true with the pallets and OSB field load, as you'll recall, uh, that these conditions exceeded the exposure limits of firefighter PPE, and this is, it was the same story with the temperatures measured around firefighter level. So the bottom line here is just, if you're gonna be adding additional uh, fuel in the form of more pallets or OSB or other, uh, you know, MDF or other particle board or uh, fiber boards, it's it's important to to ask, is it worth the added hazard? What are you trying to, achieve by adding the fires are you just trying to trying to produce a uh, more intense environment just to show off or are, is there actually a training objective there and how experienced are the participants uh, that'll be training and is it is it worth the necessary risk and lastly we saw that the interior suppression uh, may differ between the gypsum prop and the metal props, the exposure that the suppression firefighter experiences. Um, so this is something to keep in mind because most structures uh, out in the field for firefighters are lined with metal material. So they might not feel that uh, initial increase in conditions. But one thing to keep in mind is this is not these results aren't applicable to all metal C container props. And we only looked at three tests, or we only conducted three tests 
but for the test the configuration, this result was apparent. Uh, essentially, this topic needs more research, specifically looking at different ventilation configurations and prop layouts that are much bigger in volumes than volume. That hallway is kind of a small volume compared to other layouts of these types of props. And then quickly uh, looking at the uh, training considerations in terms of uh, prop durability. Uh, awareness to prop degradation is important. And so these, the gypsum prop that we built uh, was has been suggested in some uh, firefighter literature that it would be a good prop to build, build for live fire training. Um, uh, you can go ahead and do that, but you're probably going to have to rebuild after every test. So that's another reason that these metal C container props are becoming more and more popular. It's because they're durable and you can run tests back to back to back without rebuilding. And we saw more damage on the exterior uh, between the metal props to the prop, metal prop with no insulation. On the left is the insulated metal prop after multiple tests have been conducted on the right is the metal prop. You can just see visually much less damage on the insulated metal prop. Side note, the window was re-welded here on the insulated metal prop, which is why it's attached in the picture. However, we, including the window and uh, the pop welds on the sheets, we saw significant damage still with the insulated metal prop. And the uh, other thing to consider in terms of prop degradation is that you should probably conduct a number of burn-in tests before actually using the metal props for training because we saw uh, differences in temperatures between the initial tests and the later tests in, in both types of metal props. We found that the uh, insulating metal prop did not noticeably change the overall thermal environment with any of the fuels. So it begs the question is, is it worth adding the additional insulation? So during the experiments, the environments were similar between the types of metal props, but afterwards, the cooling time of the insulated metal prop was significantly longer than it was in the metal prop. And we can quickly look, take a look at the temperatures uh, at the end hall, ceiling temperatures during the periods of the test with wood-based fuels when the fire was in a decay state, so five minutes leading up to suppression. And you can see it at the five minute mark, uh, the temperatures between the props. So the, the solid lines of insulated metal and the dashed lines of the metal props, uh, they're relatively similar, however, you can see that the metal prop uh, decreases at a faster rate than the insulated metal prop. And this was, this was a consistent result across all of our tests. So this is significant because the cool down time uh, that it takes could, that could limit the number of evolutions that are possible, that are possible within one day. And this cooling down between evolutions is, is essential to ensure the safety of trainees. In fact, there was a uh, 2005 line of duty death uh, during a live fire training exercise in Pennsylvania in 2005. Uh, a firefighter uh, was stoking the fire, adding fuel to the fire, and the prop was not allowed to cool down, or it's not given significant time to cool down between evolutions that eventually uh, enough um, heat built up that when this firefighter went down to add more fuel, uh, his face piece field failed due to the intense exposure and he ended up dying. And so one of the takeaways from the NIOSH report of this, uh, of this incident was the, basically the basement burn room was not given significant time to cool down and back to, you know, is our additional fuels necessary with the OSV compared to just the pallets? Uh, 
The takeaway states that the minimum fuel load necessary to conduct the training should be used to minimize heat retention within the burner. So uh, I encourage you to look not only more uh, in depth with this project, but all of our other projects at our website at ulfirefightersafety.org and follow us on social media. We're all over the place uh, to stay up to date with projects that we're working on and the work we do.